Welcome to the Steroids Podcast with your host, Dan the Bodybuilder from Thailand. The Steroids Podcast is brought to you by Ultimate Guide to Roids, 109 page ebook by Dan the Bodybuilder from Thailand. Now, for the first time in bodybuilding history, you have someone with no corporate interests and no obligation to please anyone, not walking on eggshells to not offend. Ultimate Guide to Roids gives you the information, the whole information. The whole truth, not a full truth and a half truth, full truth. Ultimate Guide to Roids gives you the keys to the Lamborghini, gives you the information, and lets you decide what to do with it. It's a crime this information has been suppressed this long. Now let's get on with the podcast. Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Steroids Podcast, the bodybuilding podcast, since bodybuilding must have as its foundation steroids and growth hormone steroids as a minimum steroids and growth hormone together if you want to look like your heroes and this is what then allows the training and the diet to work the way that it should and they won't work unless you have those steroids or those steroids and growth hormone preferably as your base as your foundation chemicals are the foundation of bodybuilding that's why bodybuilding didn't exist until shortly after 1930s when testosterone was synthesized and then a few years after that when they started grinding up human cadaver pituitary glands in a apparatus that looked like a meat grinder for beef to turn it into ground beef it looked very similar and they would throw the human pituitary glands in there to grind them up into a extract pulp and then they would inject them, okay? So bodybuilding as we know it is steroids and growth hormone. Previous versions of very, very powerful growth hormone that were being used in the 60s and the 70s was pituitary extract growth hormone, okay? It was the juice from dead people's pituitary glands injected into bodybuilders. And the combination of growth hormone and steroids is what creates what we know as bodybuilding so that's why this podcast you know we call it the steroids podcast because that's what people think of when they think of bodybuilding but really it should be called the steroids and growth hormone podcast and really even more than that it should be called the bodybuilding podcast because bodybuilding's foundation is chemicals Steroids and growth hormone are the foundation of bodybuilding. Bodybuilding does not exist and does not work without growth hormone and steroids. All right. Go to the steroidspodcast.com website. Sign up for the VIP email list so that we beat this asshole big tech censorship that wants to delete everyone for saying the wrong thing. You think they want you to have this kind of information? Fuck no. This is the exact kind of information that they want to keep away from you. It makes you stronger. It makes you think for yourself having high testosterone levels. It makes you take your life into your own hands, your own control. Another thing that I think is funny is I was just thinking about how, you know, a lot of people have never talked, you know, never talked to anyone about steroids. It's just this secret thing that they're so interested in and studying by themselves. Hilarious, man. Hilarious. Because that is so not my life. But it it was at one point, it was at one point, so I can relate. But now, you know, that's so not my life. So it almost, and it hasn't been for so long that it almost seems like that. uh, I almost forget sometimes that, that it's like that for mostly everyone, which, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, my, my steroid talk and is just so out there (laughs) in comparison to what's normal. If you want to get on the phone with me, I am doing the one hour bodybuilding consultations we can talk about bodybuilding training diet steroids steroid cycles troubleshooting side effects etc planning anything you know whatever it is that you need we can get on those phone calls if you want to if you want to get on a phone call with me it's 59 dollars for the hour hit me up at steroidspodcast at gmail.com to inquire about that and then of course i do the texting 
with the with the guys on WhatsApp. So it's it's personal texting me between me and you. Um, you can ask me however many questions you want each day. It's daily text messaging, and I'll get back to all your questions within 24 hours or less. You know, you don't have to only ask one question per day. You can ask however many questions you want per day on the WhatsApp, and I will get back to you in 24 hours or less. That one's $99 per month. The steroids podcast text messaging coaching. So let's get on to the first question for today. Good questions today. Don asks, Hey bro, loving the steroid podcast. I was on TRT 250 milligrams for a year straight and did not notice anything other than better libido. After some research, found this 600 milligram testosterone per week study on young men and the blood work between 600 milligrams and 200 milligrams was hardly any different. It was both basically perfect blood work. My question is, can you go on 600 milligrams of TRT for life as long as you keep estrogen and blood cell count in check? And if so, why are guys shutting down their testicles for a 30% boost when they could be walking around with test levels over 2,000 with the same consequences for health? My friend tells me 600 milligrams after a while builds only as much muscle as 200 because of myostatin or something. Is this true or just more internet garbage? Thanks for your time, bro. That was a great question. Um, It is true that the health effects between 200 milligrams and 600 milligrams of testosterone per week are negligible. Um, That would be because testosterone is a natural bioidentical hormone. It's a natural part of your body. As much as the establishment would like to convince you that, you know, you make this evil, illegal substance in your balls and, you know, you're better off castrating yourself. And if you do, you better throw those balls away because if you did hold them for a second, you'd be in possession of testosterone, which is an illegal drug. So, you know, you, you human being making that illegal drug in your testicles, that illegal steroids, you, you bad person. So contrary to what those stupid bastards want to brainwash you to believe, testosterone is not toxic. If you take huge dosages of testosterone, it can do some things to you, like give you high blood pressure, and it can make a lot of estrogen, which can then mix with DHT in your prostate and make it blow up, stuff like that. Blow up meaning swell a lot. Um, But, you know, as far as things like liver values, um, kidneys, um, cholesterol, blood lipids, all that kind of shit. It doesn't really get affected much by taking testosterone. Taking large dosages of testosterone doesn't do much to it. According to blood tests, according to studies on long-term usage in young and old men and in myself and every other person that I know that has ever used testosterone and taking their blood work, this is the case. Um, some people are more sensitive than others, however, um, and there can be side effects, you know, such as uh, mental side effects, mental side effects, um, irritability, et cetera, uh, or, or, you know, sex drive being messed up, you know, because the hormones aren't balanced. But as far as, you know, really the only thing that ever really goes off if you're only on testosterone and you're using a significant dosage of it, for the most part, I'm not going to say that this is gospel, you guys, but this is general is the cholesterol in like half the guys that use it. And for those guys that get the cholesterol that goes off, usually they can make a substantial change to that and make it better by taking soluble fiber supplement. Something like a couple can't be insoluble fiber, okay? It has to be a soluble fiber supplement. And so there's a couple popular brands. There's one called OptiFiber. There's another one called Metamucil. This is kind of a sticky substance. It absorbs through your intestines, goes into your bloodstream, It attaches to the bad cholesterol that is in your bloodstream and removes it from the body, Uh, you know, significantly brings down those negative cholesterol levels. And also you should take a krill oil or fish oil in order to help with your blood lipids, keeping them healthy, and also to help with providing the raw ingredients for your good cholesterol, okay? Another thing that is contrary to popular belief is that eating cholesterol in your diet does not translate to having bad or high cholesterol levels in your bloodstream. Eating cholesterol is not correlated with the cholesterol levels in your bloodstream, okay? So now that we've got that, you know, really clear with that, um, you know, you're asking, you know, is it okay 
to be on 600 milligrams of testosterone for life. So this is one of those things where you're, you're kind of asking me permission. I, I love the question and everything, but um, this is a thing with, with taking, with taking gear, taking cycles, taking steroids. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not really sure though, if it, exactly this is what you're asking, but it's a common thing. What I'm saying, people asking for permission. A lot of people want permission to somebody else to tell them, is it okay if I do this? They want to do something, okay? They want to take a certain cycle or something, um, and they want someone else to, or they, you know, they want to take steroids even in general, and they're like, is it okay if I take steroids? <laughs> it's a personal decision, man. So it's your decision if you want to take 600 milligrams per week for life. Have the documented health effects of that been very low that are negative? Yeah, yeah. The documented health effects of taking 600 milligrams per week long term are not very severe. They're not very severe. Could something happen to you? Yeah, something could always happen to you. That's just another risk that you're adding into your life. Could something happen to you if you eat McDonald's every day for the next 10 years in a row? Yeah, something could happen to you. Could something not happen to you? Yeah. So you got to pick your battles. And so that's the thing with steroids and using steroids is that you're picking your battles. Okay. So don't use steroids. It's popular to say, oh, I use steroids so that I can have this shit diet and this shitty lifestyle and still look good. Okay. Well, you're really risking your, your, you know, you're putting up a lot of risk factors now in order, uh, you know, you're, you're not, you're not balancing the risks that you're taking. You're just adding more and more risks. The best way to take steroids is to, minimize other negative health things okay eating so you should eat a good diet you should exercise regularly you shouldn't take a ton of recreational drugs etc okay uh, if you want to take testosterone 600 milligrams per week long term the health effects that are negative that have been documented and that are anecdotal as well are not very severe but it's a personal decision that chooses, are you okay with doing that or not? Okay, the other thing is that you said, your friend tells you that 600 milligrams after a while builds only as much muscle as 200 because of myostatin or something. Is this true or just more internet garbage? It's internet garbage. Your friend doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Uh, so what happens is that there is a dosage response to testosterone use. Um, and also, so I think in that same study, actually, that, that you were looking at, the 600 milligrams per week long term in men, it was, it was showing the, uh, the muscle weight and strength, maximum strength effects of taking each individual dosage over the long term like that. And if I'm thinking of the right study, it does show that 200 milligrams produces more muscle and strength uh, or less than produces less muscle and strength than 300 milligrams and 600 milligrams produces more muscle and strength than 300 milligrams and so forth as the dosage is increased. Every cc or every milliliter of testosterone that you take more, you will get bigger and stronger and there is no limit to this. Um, to, the, to this. There is no limit to it. Um, many people will want to argue with this who don't want you to know the truth. They don't want you to know why you're so big. They want it, they, or why they're so big. They, they don't want you to get better results than them if they're not willing to do it, etc. But the God honest truth is that the more testosterone you take, and this goes the same thing with DECA too. DECA and, and testosterone are basically the two steroids that you can really just fucking jack the dosages up like crazy. And there's not really significant... Um, blood work effects that make you toxic over time, really toxic over time. Um, and which then does have a negative effect on anabolic, on anabolicness. Um, but that, you know, just make you bigger and bigger, the more milligrams you take. It's a fact. Um, haters cry about it, cry about it. Haters cry about it. Big guys with little minds who, have scarcity mindsets and don't want other people to be bigger than them or have success like them and don't want to let other people know the secrets. You take more milliliters of testosterone, you get bigger. Every milliliter you take more per week. So talking about myostatin and all this shit, or they say like your androgen receptors become less sensitive. Uh, it's the exact opposite. 
Taking steroids reduces myostatin levels in the body and increases the amount of androgen receptors on the surface of cells. So the more steroids you take, and it's in a dosage-dependent manner, the more steroids you take, the lower your myostatin will be and the more androgen receptors you will have. The opposite of what these charlatans who want you to be smaller than them and they're not willing to do what it takes to be big and don't want you to surpass them and don't want you to have the right information because they have a scarcity mindset. They're bastards. They're not really your friends. They're more like assholes. These people don't want you to know this, okay? So again, the more steroids you take, the more dosage of steroids you take, the more androgen receptors appear on your cells. The exact opposite of androgen receptor desensitivity, okay? And then as well with that, myostatin decreases with, it directly fucking decreases, okay? It directly decreases. God, it's insane these people say this bullshit, man. They are talking out of their assholes. They're literally just like, just they're just, you know what? They probably have a vagina. They're probably queefing, and that's that's uh, that's the noise that you're hearing. So ignore it. The more steroids you take, the higher the dosage is, and the longer you take them, the less myostatin your body has. Okay, next question. Will says, "I was hoping you could give me some help on a situation with my first trend cycle." It's four days in, 50 milligrams per day, trenase. My injection sites are sore. Okay, okay. <laughs> Already, I know where this is going. This is a guy, he's new with his first trenase. He's heard a lot of shit about it on the internet. And, uh, you know, he's got anxiety going right into it. He's already got the anxiety going into it. Uh, he probably is not really feeling a lot of effects on his cycle yet because day four or five, that's pretty much when you first start feeling the trenase kicking in, especially if you're only... Okay, he's using 50 milligrams per day. Yeah, that's enough. That's enough. Um, uh, so he's using 350 milligrams per week. And um, he says it's four days in and his injection sites are sore. I'm wondering if this is just really inflammatory since it's trend or maybe an infection has started. The side of my delt is a pinkish circle, warm but not hot to the touch. And the ache is a dull one, not a sharp one. All the sites have a dull ache. What do you think? That's pretty normal when you take trend injections because trend injections feel different than other injections. Um, they generally have a bit of an acidic feel to them when the actual oil hits your muscle. Whereas with testosterone, it feels more like a stretching feeling or a fullness inside of your muscle or something like a like there's pressure inside of your muscle when you take the injection and the oil starts hitting your muscle and expanding in there, you know, you're depositing it inside of your muscle. It feels like there's a pressure inside with Trembolone. You do get that same pressure, but you also get this sort of feeling like a burning or a stinging feeling, or kind of feels like there's a very mild acid being injected into you, which can actually kind of translate into kind of like a, a nerve pain or, or a feeling of like a, like a uh, referred pain or pain kind of going down your leg a little bit or something like that. It's a very uncomfortable feeling and it lasts for usually about two to three hours after the injection. And then it kind of, it pretty much fades away after that. But then, yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah, you can get post injection pain from it. You said you're getting, um, you know, a pinkish circle and it's warm, but not, uh, hot to the touch. You got a dull ache. Um, to me, it, it sounds like, you know, it's post-injection pain and you're getting, you know, the, the, you know, your body doesn't really like having that injected in there. It's getting used to it. You know, it might get better over time. Um, but let me, you know, for you guys that are in worried about infections, you know, four days in, that's pretty hard to, to tell, you know, like, do I have an infection? Generally, this is how it goes with infections. And, you know, I would know about infections since I've had my, uh, fucking leg like nearly chopped off from a steroid infection so basically what happens is it's normal to get some pain and inflammation after an injection for a few days of steroids of anabolic steroids okay but it and in and even getting like a a rash or like a pink 
uh, like a pink area, especially if it's kind of like a bad shot or you used a needle that wasn't long enough. And so the shot dripped out, the oil dripped out of the injection depot inside of the muscle. And then it mixed with the subcutaneous fat tissue, which it really mixes a lot with that stuff and causes crazy, um, like, uh, irritation in there because the oil from the steroid is a lipid molecule. And also, uh, your, your fat tissue is lipid based. And so, you know, something that is at a higher concentration moves out until it's at an equal concentration. So if that starts getting into your fat tissue, it mixes, you know, cause it's the same type of molecule. And then it goes to, uh, you know, osmosis from a higher concentration where you injected it to a lower concentration. It really spreads out under that, under the skin within that, uh, subcutaneous fat tissue. So you get this, uh, type of pinkness and irritation under there. And, and that can be, that can be alarming. Uh, but as far as infections go, uh, this is my, my advice. This is not medical advice, but this is, this is, this is my experience being a well-experienced steroid injector who has had a life-threatening steroid infection before and had surgery on it and have a big one foot long zipper scar down my left quad now. Um, Normally, steroid injections cause a little bit of pain and soreness and some quite often a little bit of uh, inflammation at the injection site. But this normally starts going away within three to four days. And that's a pretty good rule. And, and if it doesn't at least start going away by five days, that would be weird. Okay, so after an injection, it's normal to have some inflammation, some soreness, and even a little bit of pinkness can be normal for three to four days after taking it. But once it gets to five days or so, and it's still not even beginning to get better, that's starting to signal to you, I got a problem here. I might have a problem here. Okay. And if you go a week and it's still not beginning to get better. Okay. Like, like it should be better after a week, you know, but if it's not even beginning to get better still after a week, all right, it's time to go to your doctor. It's time to get some antibiotics. You got an infection, man. Uh, your, your body is not able to clear that area. And so you now need antibiotics, um, to help your body to clear whatever the fuck is in there now. So with my infection, because people, you know, they're scared about my infection, you know. My infection is like an anecdotal thing that happened, and they see it, and it's horrific, and they're like, fuck, how can I make sure that what happens to this guy never happened to me? Well, let me tell you one thing. If I would have taken care of it, you know, in the way that I'm telling you guys now, um, you know, my situation would have turned out much better. So I was very arrogant and in denial about what I had on myself. I was saying, I have the knowledge to fix this. I can fix it. I know what to do. I don't need a doctor. And I was also in denial about it. I would keep it covered and not look at it. And I, you know, it was very bad. And whenever I would look at it, it would freak the shit out of me but I would just kind of like pretend like it wasn't there. And, you know, it was, it ended up being, you know, after a while, you know, the abscess or the lump that I had on my leg then exploded and then all the skin disintegrate, disintegrated and it was an open uh, wound or sore with no skin about the size of a Pringles can on my leg. Um, and, you know, then I was, you know, I'd never had something on my, on my body before, you know, a hole in my skin that never healed or a cut or something that never healed. So I was, again, I was kind of like in denial, you know, about my situation. And I let this go on for two months before I finally went to the doctor. Okay. And that was what put me in this, you know, heinous life threatening situation. So what I'm telling you now is that if you've got a problem and it's not even beginning to get better after a week, you got to go to the doctor, man. You don't want to be in a situation like I had. Well, follow that advice. 
All right. Next question is from Nathan. Enjoyed the last pod immensely. In that podcast, you briefly touched on getting rid of blood or blood donation for high hemoglobin and hematocrit. I donate double red blood cells every four months at a place here in Reno, Nevada. Altitude is 5,100 feet. That, that's pretty high altitude. That is the maximum donation. So at higher altitudes, you know, you create more red blood cells because there's less oxygen at higher altitudes. So your body adapts. That is the maximum donations they will allow without a prescription for therapeutic phlebotomy. Therapeutic phlebotomy is when the doctor orders um, to have you have blood released from your body and thrown away. Um, it only brings my hemoglobin down from 19 to 17. And... Um, there's no other blood donation facilities within a 200 mile radius. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is pretty typical actually. Like for, for guys on cycle to have a, a hemoglobin, like 18, 19 on a test or 17 and generally giving blood one time brings the level down two or three points. Um, more of a normal range would be 14, 15, 16. And uh, you're get, doing double red blood cells, so it even seems like you, more than average, produce a lot of red blood cells. And one of the primary effects of taking anabolic steroids, any anabolic steroids, is that they increase your red blood cell count, which makes it so that there's more oxygen in the avail available in the blood to deliver to your muscles. Makes perfect sense. So if you go off of cycle, you won't just... Or if you just keep cycling over and over again, you won't just continually build up more and more blood, red blood cells, okay? So right now, if you've got high red blood cell count, if you went off of your cycle, your red blood cell count would start going down over the course of a month or two. Um, you know, you wouldn't just be stuck with having those red blood cells from being on your cycle. And the only thing you could do about it was to, you know, drain your blood out to get them out. Um, they would be reabsorbed over the course of a couple months. So that, that's, that's for your information. And the other thing you say, you know, is there anything else you can do since there's no other blood donation center? You're donating maximum and you don't want to talk to your doctor. Not really, man. If, if you're worried about your, your hematocrit, which is the amount of red blood cells you have, or, or your hemoglobin means the ratio of um, how many red blood cells in a specific volume of blood, so the density of your blood, um, you know, the only way to really affect that is to get rid of the blood. Uh, so there's no medications or anything like that that you can take uh, to to reduce that. Um, you know, you said you said uh, you don't you don't want to get a prescription for it. Well, you know, if if you for some reason feel um, shy about that, maybe maybe go talk to a new doctor so you can be a little bit more, uh, you know, whatever the doctor you have a relationship with, maybe for some reason you feel shy with him with that. So maybe you need to talk to a different one about that, you know, be a, a comfortable doctor patient relationship. <laughs> I don't really know what else to tell you, man. Cause, uh, you, you know, it, when you have the, the higher hematocrit and hemoglobin, let me just tell you what it does. Okay. It makes your blood slightly thicker because there's more density to it. There's more red blood cells in the same amount of space um, or in the same volume of blood. So then what happens is your heart has to work a little bit harder to push the blood around. Um, it's not a massive amount, but it, it is harder. And basically maintaining that over long periods of time is going to make your heart work harder over long periods of time. And that's not something that is favorable. So it would be good to donate your blood. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, that's why bodybuilders do blood donations. Just to give you guys, you know what, I'm, I was going to say my personal, usually personally me guys, I donate blood three or four times a year. Okay. But during this pandemic, I've only donated blood zero times. <laughs> I don't want to go get in their system during this, okay? So it is what it is. Was that a healthy thing of me to do? It wasn't the healthiest thing of me to do. 
It is what it is. Jackson asks, Hey Dan, question for the podcast regarding erectile dysfunction. I have zero desire and my dick almost feels like it's not even there. I've been blasting and cruising since I was 19. 21 now. Got diagnosed with low testosterone at 19. I've legit tried everything including HCG, Clomid, dopamine agonists, and even running high testosterone with Proviron with no luck. The last thing I have in mind that could be causing this is my blood pressure. What are your thoughts? One year of being on gear, five years of lifting before starting. What a scam natural bodybuilding is. He sent some pictures of him uh, before and after he started taking steroids, and the, the, the difference was actually astronomical. Uh, he, he went from being like a, a guy naturally that looked like skin and bones to looking like a guy who was, a, a, you know, a really muscular dude. Uh, so let's see what you've taken. You've taken HCG. You've taken Clomid. Clomid's not going to be good for your sex drive. Just FYI, Clomid makes you feel like shit. Um, just Clomid sucks, you guys. Use, if you're going to use something like that, use Novodex instead of Clomid. Um, you've used dopamine agonists. So have you used cabergoline? Because that's normally what a dopamine agonist is. Um, and you've run high tests with Proviron with no luck. Um, one of the thoughts I have to ask is, have you used generic human growth hormone? Because as we know, generic growth hormone is not growth hormone. So to let you guys know, every FDA approved pharmaceutical grade growth hormone has to specifically get their method for creating the growth hormone approved by the FDA. So every brand has a different method that they use to produce the growth hormone and it's a secret recipe and it has to specifically be approved by the FDA. Okay. So Cero Stim is not being made by the same recipe as Nordytropin is not being made by the same recipe as Genotropin and each company that wants to produce FDA approved human growth hormone has to get their individual recipe approved. Okay. And so now you think that some drug dealer with his machine can go produce growth hormone that is going to be the growth hormone that these pharmaceutical companies have with their secret recipes. That is such horseshit. It's such horseshit. It's just fucking crazy. And, you know, I'll get attacked for this all day, man, because because the, the damn generic growth hormone is the highest grossing, uh, you know, like if you're selling PEDs, that's where you make the most money is is by selling generic growth hormone. <laughs> so, anyways, generic growth hormone, guys. Another thing with it is that, you know, they can get growth hormone-like molecules, pituitary gland, pituitary hormone-like molecules that will come up positive for growth hormone and will increase your IGF-1, get an IGF-1 response. But does that mean that it is real human identical 191 amino acid human growth hormone. No, no, it does not. No, no generic growth hormone is real. It's bullshit, okay? It's bullshit. Try it yourself. If you must try it, try it yourself and find out. But make sure you try both. And you only, in order to know what the effects of pharmaceutical grade human growth hormone are, all you'll need is 130 IU pen and take four, four IUs or three IUs for a week or something like that. And you'll freaking know what the effects are at the end of the week, okay? This isn't rocket science. This isn't rocket science. Just try them both so that you freaking know that what I'm saying is correct. <laughs> okay, and so this is a thing with generic growth hormone is it fucks up your sex drive because the pituitary gland and the hormones that it creates, one of the hormones that it creates is growth hormone and another one that it creates is fucking prolactin. And prolactin is what comes out of your pituitary gland right when you have an orgasm and then it makes your boner go down and then it makes you feel like, oh, I'm not interested in sex. Or for example, if you were having sex with someone you didn't like, you're like, fuck, I got to get this person away from me. <laughs> All right. So that's, that's what prolactin does to you. Okay. And if you're taking generic growth hormone, it is very common to get these types of effects. And to have it fuck your sex drive, fuck your sexual performance and response, and then for it to linger for months, for months after you stop taking it, okay? 
Very unfortunate reality. So I have to ask, were you taking generic human growth hormone? Okay. Well, well I th- you know, he probably wasn't though, Jackson. He probably wasn't taking it. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But really what I, what I, have, what I have to say for you is that you would be a good candidate to, to do like a phone call with me so that we could really get in depth to what you've been doing and come out with a plan for you because it's hormones, man. And, and you can be fixed. It's not like you're fucked for life. We just have to find out, figure out, troubleshoot, you know, what your, your hormones were, et cetera. And, and, you know, get you on the right track. Um, we can fix what's going on with you, but my advice to you would be to just take normal testosterone levels, go off of anything that you're on. I don't know if you're on recreational drugs either. That's also a possibility. Get off of all that shit. Okay. And be on one thing. Okay. You should be on testosterone 500 to 750 milligrams per week. Something like Proviron one tablet per day. HCG, 500 IUs, about three times per week. And make sure that your estrogen levels are balanced. Take a little bit of cabergolin if you take a blood test and your prolactin isn't perfect. And maybe even still take a little bit. It's up to you. And then wait for a while. Do that. Continue it for a few months and see what happens. Sometimes... People are seriously fucked up and the, uh, they've got desensitization of different receptors in their brain. And, uh, those receptors have to take time to recover from whatever they've been doing, um, and resensitize again before things will get back to normal. But you're not fucked for life, Jackson. Um, you, this is a hormonal issue and it can be fixed. Okay, next question is from Carrie. Thinking about getting on a cycle of testosterone, wondering which one do you suggest, testinanthate or testcipionate? Thinking about 250 milligrams and maybe increasing later to 500 milligrams. Looking to add strength and overall feeling better. Not looking to bodybuilding body. I'm 50 years old, play competitive softball. Thanks for the help. Love the podcast. Keep up the truth about it all. Learned so much already. Thanks. Yeah, I I get what you're asking for. You. You just want to feel like you're you're the way you did when you were a, a younger man again. You know, you're 50 years old now. You're feeling the effects of having lower testosterone. That's normal. There's a lot of hormone disrupting chemicals all over the environment. So even young guys nowadays have low testosterone. You know, you drink a cup of water out of your plastic cup. You get hormone disrupting chemicals from that that neutralize your testosterone. You get neutralizing chemicals when you get in the shower and the shower water pours over you you got it in all this processed food all this shit that you're coming in contact with all day and so your your testosterone just gets completely fucked it's like man i feel like it's my responsibility to be on steroids so i have normal testosterone levels in this fucked up environment okay so he wants the the quality of life benefits mainly uh 250 milligrams it's going to be it's going to get you the energy it's going to get you the sex drive it's going to get your mind back in the place where you want it, where you feel more motivated, you feel more aggressive, you act like less of a pussy. (laughs) It's real, guys. It's real. If you have a little testosterone, you act like more of a pussy. Okay? This goes for everyone. it, It goes for everyone. What makes a man a man? Testosterone. You have low testosterone. Your behavior becomes more like a pussy. Your emotions and attitude becomes more like a pussy. What happens when you take testosterone? You don't really take shit from people anymore. You're more willing to defend your rights. You're more willing to fight for your rights. Your fear of being in a physical fight goes down way, way down. Okay? Um... There's a lot of reasons why the powers that be might want you to have lower testosterone levels. It makes you very much easier to herd. All right. So 250 milligrams of testosterone is going to be enough to get you that and enough to get you some subtle benefits with your physique or with your body, um, the way your body looks, the way your body feels. And when I say subtle benefits, I mean, it's going to be like, you know, you, you, you notice, hey, I've, I've made some progress. You know, I've made a little bit of progress in the gym. It's like, 
I took a supplement that worked. That's what it's going to feel like. It's not going to feel like, damn, I'm on fucking steroids. And, and now I'm like blowing up. And it's the same thing with 500 milligrams. It's not going to do that to you either. Uh, but 500 milligrams will be enough to where you're feeling like, you know, if you did that for a year, you know, at the end of the year, you'd be like, and you were lifting weights going to the gym, you'd be like, yeah, you know, I've made a significant change to my body in the last year. But as far as doing that for like 10 weeks, 12 weeks, you know, you'll, you'll make some changes, but it won't be anything, you know, hardcore or, or at all or anything like that. It'll just be like, yeah, there were some changes made. Uh, so, so this is, we're being realistic right now with, with, uh, with testosterone dosages, realistic. If you want to get that effect where you're taking testosterone and you're like, and you're like, damn, I'm getting like big changes from this. You have to hit a threshold dosage. That's a thousand milligrams a week of testosterone. So, uh, I, I mean, I think it's a good idea what you want to take. You're wondering if you should take a test E or test sipping it because, because of your situation and what you want it for. And 500 milligrams would be like, you know, like a, a nice strong boost to what you're doing, you know, but, and, and 200, 250 milligrams would just be enough to, you know, get you feeling good again, get you, getting you back to feeling normal again. 500 is more like now you got the power over the long term. Sipionate and enanthate, the difference is so negligible. You can't even tell the difference between the two. The way that they peak in the body and then how long they, they last until they go away is basically identical. So those testosterone enanthate and testosterone sipionate are totally interchangeable. And the best dosage schedule that is normal for each of them is uh, twice per week injection. Okay, next question is from Keith asks, I'm new to the podcast and I've learned a lot. Is my normal doctor someone that can prescribe me steroids? I'm guessing he's, he's talking about his general practitioner. Or does it have to be a hormone clinic? I work six days a week. I'm 5'11", 240 pounds, but work out five days a week. Not sure specific names, but tre trend test and super draw or D-ball just to see results. Dosage, not sure if I go oral way not through doctor will i fail my drug test at work i'm a truck driver just don't want to be another fat ass on my way now to purchase your book ultimate guide to roids 109 page ebook by dan the bodybuilder from thailand thanks in advance okay yeah so usually the general practitioners don't know anything about hormones or hormone replacement therapy you know generally when you do go to your general practitioner for basically anything he then uh does like an intake of you and then refers you to a specialist. That's kind of what they do. Uh, if it's for anything, you know, serious or, you know, because they just don't learn about it. They spend like one day learning about hormones in medical school and that's it. Uh, and then, and then, you know, it goes to the special treat doctors like a endocrinologist. If they, if they want to, uh, you know, learn a lot about hormones, et cetera. But there's also some liability with, testosterone prescriptions and just things that these guys don't know. So, I mean, yeah, you can ask them if they'll prescribe it to you. Uh, they'll probably refer you to an endocrinologist though. Um, you know, going to a hormone replacement therapy clinic or a longevity clinic, anti-aging clinic, you know, they do them telehealth online. So you can do, uh, you can send them your blood work. You can find these places online, send them your blood work, do a phone call with them and they'll, they'll prescribe you, you know, testosterone and Sometimes other stuff like DECA, Anadrol, Anavar, growth hormone, HCG, Arimidex, etc. But uh, no one's going to prescribe you Trend or Superdraw <laughs> or D-Ball. Uh, th those don't get prescribed here in, in, in America. Superdraw never did. Uh, Trend used to. D-Ball used to. But uh, they don't do that anymore. Um, so you're wondering, though, if you'll fail a drug test from taking steroids and no drug tests, tests for normal drug tests, tests for uh, recreational drugs. And the way that steroids have to be tested for is every single individual steroid has to be tested for. And it's expensive to do that. So when you take a steroid test, 
Um, this is not normal for employers to test you for steroids uh, when f when you take a drug test. You you, you they'll have to use a specific steroid test on you to test you for steroids, and uh, each individual steroid would have to be known by them and tested for by them in order to like pop you on a drug test. Um, steroids are definitely not normally tested for on on drug tests. Um, so yeah, my, my advice to you would be that if you want to get, uh, you know, steroids, hormone replacement therapy from a doctor that you, um, look up a, a clinic that can do it telehealth with you, a hormone replacement therapy clinic, a, uh, anti-aging clinic, et cetera, longevity clinic, and, uh, they can help you out for sure, man. <laughs> okay. Next question is from squat pro. Hey, Dan, question for the podcast. What do you think about running 1,000 milligrams of testosterone and anthate with 800 milligrams of Primobol in a week, Superdrawl at 20 milligrams per day for weeks 2 to 6, and Winstrol uh, weeks 20, 10 to 16? And he doesn't say the dosage on the Winstrol, but I'm assuming it means like 50 milligrams or something. Cycle would last 16 weeks in total. Also, would Aromacin be a good AI to combat estrogen? Is there anything you would change? Modify. Thanks. Yeah, this is a good question, and I wanted to uh, include this one on the podcast because, you know, a lot of you guys hearing that, you know, you'll hear numbers like 1,000, 800, and then orals, and you'll be like, oh, 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 it's a, it's a big steroid cycle. Well, guys, this is the type of steroid cycles that people take who look jacked, Okay. They lie to you on the internet. They lie to you in the gym. They lie to you everywhere. And they say, you know, I take a couple cc's of testosterone. These guys are retarded. <laughs> you know, that's why I talk like that and imitate their voice like that. Because, like, you fucking retard. Just don't just either say the truth or don't say anything at all. Because it's just so smoke and mirrors, man. It's so smoke and mirrors. It's just such... Horse shit. It's like, get real, motherfucker. Get out of my face. All right. This is a normal cycle for guys that want to be like, you know, fucking jacked, fucking big, dominant in every gym they go to, like a big ass buff dude in every gym they go to. This is the normal kind of stuff that these guys take, the normal types of dosages. This guy, again, 1,000 test, 800 primo, super draw 20 milligrams for four weeks, and then taking a break for four weeks of orals. Continuing the injectables and then finishing up with another four weeks orals at the end. 16 weeks total. That's a normal cycle, guys, for guys that are fucking jacked. So, and then he asked, you know, would aromacin be a good AI to combat estrogen? Yeah, aromacin is the best AI. Aromacin is a steroid and it is a natural hormone in the body. It is a metabolite of testosterone that is very has a high affinity for the aromatase enzyme, the enzyme that transforms testosterone into estrogen. And so basically what happens is when you put aromacin into the body, it's very non-toxic, and it binds with the aromatase enzyme. The aromatase enzyme is very attracted to the aromacin. Eximestane is the generic name, okay? It's the chemical name. That's the difference between there's no difference between aromacin and eximestane, okay? And then once uh, the aromacin has been uh, binded up to the aromatase enzyme, the aromatase enzyme is removed from the body. It's destroyed. Uh, it's called a suicide estrogen inhibitor because it inactivates the aromatase enzyme permanently. Um, and out of all the AIs, Arimidex, Letrozole, Aromacin. Aromacin is the most healthy. It's a steroidal aromatase inhibitor, and it is a non, basically non-toxic. Um, whereas the the other AIs can have a little bit more of a effect on your blood work. Um, aromacin does need to be taken with fat, though. It needs to be taken with dietary fat in order to be absorbed properly because it's a steroid. So when you take it, you need to take some, you know, you can take it with your fish oil that you take in the morning or you can take it with your, um, you know, you can, you can have a glass of milk with it, you know, whatever, you know, whatever kind of dietary fat, you know, a little bite of cheese or something. It just needs something to be able to bind to because remember steroids are lipid soluble molecules 
and uh, you know they're cholesterol based, and you know in order to get proper absorption, they need to have other lipids to um, bind to to get through the gut properly. All right. So it sounds like a great cycle, man. You ask, you know, is there anything you would change or modify? Well, there is, there is, and and that would be that I I would say, uh, if you can, add two IU's of pharmaceutical grade human growth hormone per day. And that will make a massive difference to your cycle. You know, people talk about, you know, you need to use lots of IUs of growth hormone. That's not true. Um, That's because they're using garbage that is not growth hormone generics. And so there's all these smoke and mirrors, okay? You use pharmaceutical grade growth hormone with your steroid cycle, and after a week, you can definitely see the results, okay? And growth hormone makes your entire, whatever your cycle is doing, okay? Whatever your cycle is doing, whatever you're noticing from your steroids, you add in growth hormone, and it increases the effect a lot, okay? All the steroids become stronger. All of them, any effects you're getting become more pronounced and more prominent. And it's really, you know... Like I said earlier, back in the golden era, the bodybuilders back then were using growth hormone. They were using, we were talking about earlier, pituitary extract growth hormone. They were injecting an extract from ground up pituitary glands from dead people, injecting that, and they were mixing it with the steroids. If you want to look like your heroes, if you want to, you know, if you're looking at people and thinking, what is it that they're doing and I'm not doing? Why don't I look like them? I'm on steroids. Well, that's because just saying steroids is bodybuilding is more smoke and mirrors. It's steroids and growth hormone. If you want to look like your heroes, it's steroids and growth hormone. You use what they use. If you want to sound like your heroes and you're a musician, well, then you get the same equipment that they use. You get the same guitars. You get the same amplifiers, etc. With this, you got to use the same steroids, the same chemicals, the same growth hormones, etc. Okay, so now we have, you know, this is what I'm saying. Take a couple I use a human growth hormone. If you're an experienced bodybuilder who's experienced on steroids before and you've never tried it, dude, the reason why I talk so highly of it on this podcast is because it's the real deal. Okay, and as far as generic growth hormone, that is not the real deal, and that's going to leave you nothing but disappointment. So you take the real stuff, and you notice. Damn, damn, okay, now I know what he was talking about, okay, now I've experienced it from my own fucking eyes in a week, okay, last question is from Cam, bro, a real simple question for the podcast, but I'd like your take as there's so much bullshit in our community, what's your opinion on protein shakes, I keep hearing that the pros don't use them at all, I like protein shakes, but not at the um, as the exclusion uh, or to replace meat, whole food. Uh, whey protein is a good protein source, and it is very fast acting, and it's good used as a supplement. You should use supplements as supplements. Um, and I have had gains from using protein powder in the past with steroids. It works good um, if you take it directly after your workout. So, for example, if you eat uh, dextrose or glucose-based carbohydrates and you take whey protein with that directly after your workout, well, the whey protein isolate absorbs into your bloodstream in about 15 minutes, which is pretty much the same speed as the uh, carbohydrates, the sugars uh, get into your bloodstream and spike your insulin. Um, And so when, you know, your, your insulin opens the opens the floodgates to the cells now they can take in energy insulin is a transport molecule so now you've also got the whey protein in there very quickly um and then the carbohydrates in there which then you know directly after your workout when the muscles on the steroids are very sensitive to refueling with glycogen and taking in nutrients that they need for recovery um, and building back stronger the the cell is now open from having the insulin, the transport molecule in the blood. And so if you have the right ingredients in there, the right raw materials in there, then the, the muscle can take uptake those raw materials at a heightened at a heightened or amplified rate. Okay. So that is absolutely a good way to use whey protein like that. Another good way to do it 
would be if, you know, you're trying to get 300 milligrams of protein or 300 grams of protein per day and you're eating chicken and beef, four meals per day, five meals per day, and you're getting up to, let's say, 250 milligrams or why do I keep saying milligrams? Thinking steroids, 250 grams of protein per day. And you're like, man, I'm eating like, you know, I've eaten a lot of meat today. You know, at that point, yeah, you've eaten enough meat and you don't have to keep on eating more meat. If you want to get up to 300 grams, you can add a couple scoops of whey protein at the end of the day. And, you know, if that would have been the difference between you not getting to 300 grams because you would have just said, okay, well, I'm not doing it. And then you getting to 300 grams because you took the whey protein as a supplement after eating whole food all day. Well, then that is going to help you and it's going to help you make more gains. So with the with the whey protein the temptation that a lot of guys do is replacing their whole food with the whey protein. And that's the wrong approach because that will give lackluster results. Um, it will give shit results. Okay. So the, the whole food, it, it, don't, don't get uh, too scientific with, with bodybuilding saying like, well, it, it contains the right ingredients. It should work and, and stuff like you got, <laughs> you are an animal. Okay. You are an animal. And animals that are taken out of their natural environment and put on artificial diets made with uh, stuff produced in factories that have impurities and shit in them are not as healthy as animals that are in their natural habitats and eating their natural diets, okay? So anytime you get any food that is made in a factory, any processed food, food that did not come from an animal, it did not, you know, directly from an animal, or eating an animal, or grown in the ground, came from the ground, plants, etc. You're taking in impurities, and it's doing stuff to you uh, that is, you know, those those processed, man-made produced ingredients have stuff in them, and it doesn't matter if science knows that they do or not. Okay, because we know by experience that they do, and they don't work as good. So you have all the noobs who want to do all this shit with uh, knowing their science and replacing all of the whole food that we do for a reason in bodybuilding and that people who are successful have always done, replacing that with all this bullshit and they think they're so smart, okay? Well, those are the noobs, okay? Those are the guys that don't get far, okay? Those are the guys that have this over-reliance on their religion of science um, and that they're, they, they think they're so smart from doing this that they ignore the evidence that's sitting right in front of their faces to the contrary, okay? So it experience always trumps science, you guys. It's all about experience. Experience always trumps theory. And you should go, if you want to be a successful bodybuilder, you should be following what other experienced guys are doing. And, you know, they're not replacing all of their meals with protein powder. <laughs> If that's you, if that's you, just stop doing it. Eat whole food, okay? Stop eating all the, the diet bars and all this shit. You can have those as treats, okay? Or you can have them as supplements. So eating them, eating them, you know, once or twice a day, something like that, okay? But if you want the big success, you have got to do it the right way, okay? Don't be one of these noobs who thinks he's so smart and he knows his science of the body. And that's why he has no gains, If you would like your questions to be answered on the Steroids Podcast, go to steroidspodcast.com and leave a comment with your questions or email or private message steroidspodcast at gmail.com or steroidspodcast on Instagram. Until next time. <laughs>